Just recently, we saw a new year begin. And with that, people make new year resolutions. Some make a plan to better themselves. Some say they're going to exercise. Some say they're going to lose weight. Some say they're going to show self-control, not eat as many sweets, and on and on. Well, for the non-athletic person, there is a new calorie guide that's out. I think you'd get a laugh out of this. And each one of these exercises, there's an amount of calories that you burn in an hour. For instance, how about beating around the bush? You can lose 75 pounds, 75 uh, calories in an hour. How about jumping to conclusions? I don't know, I think jumping jacks would probably get more done. How about climbing the walls? I think maybe a little Bible reading and prayer might calm your nerves and don't have to climb walls. Swallowing your pride. Passing the buck. And then there are those who throw their weight around and they're either bullies or bosses or those that like to take charge. Let's let the elders do that. Dragging your heels. Pushing your luck. Making molehills into mountains. Bending over backwards. How about bending forward to touch your toes? Eating crow. Adding fuel to the fire. Opening can of worms. Well, there are probably some things we could add to that, but tonight I want to talk about spiritual exercise. You know, Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, some things regarding this. If you'd like to turn with me there to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. I hope we have a better situation spiritually than the one that went to the doctor and he asked the doctor, is, is there anything I can do to get in shape? And the doctor says the bad news, I don't think you're in shape to work to try to get into shape. But we're always able with our mind to study the word and get tip-top shape in our, our spiritual fervor, our spiritual level. We can go from one point to a greater amount of trust and grow in the grace and the knowledge of God. Uh, we know the importance of physical exercise. Before I go to Africa, I always walk several weeks before I go so that when I'm walking up the mountains, I'm not always struggling behind like Justin, uh, puffing and huffing and trying to get his breath. Ask him sometime how this old man outdid him once going up Chabakua Mountain. It almost killed me, but I had to show him up. <laughs> no. This text tells us about Paul giving these instructions on how the evangelist should be, but how he should train others. Remember what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. So 
So what I'm emphasizing is what is good for me is good for you and, and good for each of us. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witness, witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That should be our goal, to help each generation coming up where they can stand on their own two spiritual feet. They can defend the truth. They can uh, convict the game slayer. They can help the ignorant to learn and better prepare themselves for what lays ahead. Judgment Day. But he warns Timothy about making sure he doesn't give himself over to fables and myths and genealogies. I would like to say that the genealogies we find in Matthew 1 and Luke chapter 3 are profitable for our learning. It might be boring to read so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so. And anytime someone begins a Bible reading program and start with Matthew chapter 1, they lose their zeal, they lose their oomph, and they get discouraged. Why? If this is what reading the Word of God is all about, I could do without it. And what a shame. But he then tells him if he does that which he will be encouraged to do, he will be a good minister. And while physical exercise profits a little, and we'll talk about a few things, we want to really emphasize spiritual exercise. What do we need for proper spiritual exercise? We can exercise our brains. In fact, I've got, uh, I have, used to have a couple uh, apps on my phone where I did puzzles. Now I've only got one. And, and at waiting rooms or waiting uh, at a long red light, you can do a few things, uh, not be too distracted, but I think it's good to exercise your brain, exercise your body. In order to exercise, you first need to be ready. Have a readiness to know that there's something I can do to improve. There's something I can learn. There is something I can be challenged with that I might be a better servant and a better brother in Christ. That I might help the younger or even the older. There always is a decision of the mind that needs to be made. There always is willingness to begin. There always is uh, the need for desire if you don't want to do something, no one can manipulate you or force you or convince you. But spiritually speaking, we have to do the same. Decide with your mind. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end of the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Be like those... Uh, in Acts 17, verse 11, those Bereans who were characterized as being noble or worthy, it says, these were more noble than those at Thessalonica. You know, I, I don't know if I really like comparisons to you, but in, in reality, we learn by seeing comparisons. Something that's good compared to something that's mediocre. It makes us uh, want to, to improve, to do something that will increase us. But he says, these are more noble in that they receive the word with the readiness of mind. I see individuals who are sitting on the edge of their seat, and they've got both ears just and their eyes focused on the speaker. What are you, you going to say next? What, what, what's going to be... Uh, the next thing you say to that's really going to just uh, blow my mind, change me. I'm ready to hear the meat of the word. They searched the scriptures daily to see if the things that they heard were so. Don't take the word for granted. A lot of times 
people say, what does the word mean? What does the gospel say about this subject? And they ask somebody, elder, what do you say? Preacher, what does the Bible say? Go to the Bible for yourself. Get a book uh, of questions. Study it. Get a concordance. Look up that subject and find all the scriptures that deal with uh, that subject. And you know what? That which you learn on your own, it will stick with you longer than what that preacher says. But there needs to be a desire to act. Once we've made that decision, we're ready to begin. Act on it. John 13, 17 says, If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. James 1, 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Not only are we to be ready, once we start, we need to continue. Repetition is one of the best teachers. I don't know how many times in preacher school when I had a verse to, rem to memorize, how I would take that and constantly look at it uh, during the day, just keep looking at it, putting it to my memory. It wasn't easy to do it in just one setting. It took more than that, but repetition. In exercise, there's repetitions. If, if a weightlifter is wanting to work on a certain portion of his body, whether it's his arms or if his chest or his legs, he'll, he'll have one day to do the arms, one day to do his legs, and one day for cardio to work on his lungs and his breathing and his stamina. And there's, there's different things to accomplish specific goals. In order to exercise, repeat. Walking two steps isn't exercise. Doing one lift isn't exercise. One must repeat whatever it is one is doing multiple times in order for it to stick and, and for it to take its uh, course and, and leave an impression on you. But how about spiritually? Do we utter one short prayer and call it devotion? Do we, utter, do we read one verse and call that study? Do we just get one service per week and call that faithful? You know, Jesus implied repetition with these words. Luke 9, 23. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross. How often, Jesus? Daily. Not once a week, not once a month. Take up your cross daily and follow me. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. So in order to exercise ourselves spiritually, we need to involve ourselves in repetition of these spiritual activities. Someone might say, well, reading the scripture is boring. Well, physical, physical exercise is boring too. That's why when you see the runners, they've got these earplugs or or something on their belt, uh, a recorder. They're, they're listening to music or something uh, as they go to occupy their mind and uh, make it not so boring. The spiritual exercise, it's not boring. It's learning something new, and it's making you in the image of Christ Jesus. That can't be wrong. Thirdly, spiritual exercise needs resistance. Until you debate, until you defend what you believe and practice spiritually, your skills don't get sharpened. When you actually, in a discussion, not in an argument, but in a good Bible discussion with somebody, what they promote, what you know is true, and, and you think of uh, scriptures that will help defend uh, the truth against ignorance, that is that resistance. Have you ever tried to exercise without resistance? People use weights to push or rubber bands. They'll use their own body weight as resistance to build muscle. You know what happens to astronauts who spend any amount of time in outer space? There's no resistance. And their muscles atrophy and they have to really... Uh, Go through training after they get back to the earth. But exercise.
exercise demands resistance, and that's spiritually too. We need to resist temptation. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, excuse me, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is as common to man. For God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Imagine not having to face temptation, trials, troubles in life. What if everything was just easy all the time? Where's the challenge? Where's the growth? Where's the improvement that you can gain? Ephesians 6, 13 says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the day of evil, and having done all, to stand. In today's age, what day is there not evil that we have to face? It surrounds us. We need to resist the devil. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. That tells me we're not alone. And I can be encouraged by watching faithful men and women win over temptation and the struggles. We need to resist uh, against persecution and be prepared. Those who attack our Christian values, those who attack our principles that we gain from the Word of God. Matthew 5, 11 and 12 says, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Even Jesus says, even your own countrymen will give you grief. First Peter 4, 14 says, If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of the glory and of God rest upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. I'd rather receive that persecution that I might give God the glory than be idle, be happy and content. And so in order to exercise in godliness, we have to resist that which is evil and cling to that which is good. Lastly, in spiritual exercise, we need resolution. To be resolved. You can always begin, but do you finish? In order for our exercise to do us good, this takes a mindset. I will not quit. I will not stop. I will keep going. We would do well to begin, but if we won't stick with it, exercise will do us no good. Spiritually, we have to be committed for the long haul. The long term, as long as it demands, as long as I'm alive on this earth, we cannot afford to look back. Luke 9, verse 62 says, No man having put his hand to the plow is worthy of me if he, looking back. What happens when you look back? You think, oh, the good old days. I was free. I was happy. Boy, I enjoyed myself. That's Satan talking to you. Hebrews 10, 38 says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall, know, shall have no pleasure in him. Oh, be steadfast, unmovable. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So tonight, are we exercising ourselves unto spirituality? As you're reading your Bible in your schedule each day, are you not being challenged with new things, hearing and reading, seeing things that are valuable for our spiritual lives? Mark them down. When you 
you see something that you haven't thought of and it challenged you spiritually, share it with us. Put it on our, our Facebook message page. Hey, brethren, I found something today that really helped me today. Share it. I'll do the same thing. We can encourage and strengthen one another. Oh, let's exercise ourselves spiritually by being ready with repetition, with resistance training, and resolution. I will not quit. May you be encouraged. If you have the need of responding to the invitation of Christ Jesus, for any reason, this is the perfect time. Stand up and say, I need help. Do you? Come while we stand while we sing.